well, I'll just say who I am first of all. I'm Bob Mills. I'm in the History of Art Department at UCL, and I've been working for a few years on a saint called Wilgefortis. And Wilgefortis, according to legend, um, is the daughter of a pagan king in Portugal. Secretly, in her youth, she decides to convert to Christianity, devotes herself to a life of chastity. Then later in life, the king of Sicily decides that he wants to marry Wilgefortis. So he asks the father for Wilgefortis's hand in marriage. She point blank refuses. This makes the father very angry. So he throws his daughter in prison. And while in prison, she prays for a disfigurement to um, make her unattractive to her prospective husband. Um, this works. The next day, she is given a luxurious beard, miraculously. This puts the Sicilian king off. Her father is even more angry now, so he decides to have his daughter crucified. And from the cross, she prays that anyone who invokes her name in memory of her martyrdom will be released from their sufferings. And this explains some of the names that are associated with the, the saint, as well as Wilgefortis. She's also sometimes called Uncumber, that's her name in England. Ontkoma is the name in the Netherlands. And Cuminus is the name in German-speaking regions. And they're all linked to this ability that um, the saint has to unencumber or release people of their burdens and those burdens can range anything from physical and mental um, sufferings through to um, imprisonment um, or even unwanted husbands. So she has a bit of a reputation in some regions of Europe for actually delivering wives of their um, unwanted husbands. Um, so yeah, a fascinating figure. From a modern perspective, what do you think is going on here? Well, um, I mean, various various interpretations. I mean, one is that perhaps this represents a desire um, amongst uh, late medieval worshippers for some kind of ambiguously gendered divine figure of some kind beyond the sort of um, idea that, you know, God is straightforwardly male or that Christ is a straightforwardly masculine figure. And indeed, images of Christ crucified um, himself are often... Um, gendered ambiguous in some ways. So this might be, the cult of Wilgefortis might be an extension of that desire for, for differently gendered bodies and experiences when it comes to representing the divine. Is, is there any, let's say, um, problem um, the, the church authorities might have had with the worship of, 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 of a of a sort of a trans saint? Yeah, well, I mean, interesting, you you use the phrase trans in relation to this. I mean, that's certainly one way in which I've been thinking about these images, the extent to which they might resonate with some of our, you know, current ideas of gender and sexuality and gender transition and transformation. Um, in terms of the, the church, I mean, looking back to the Middle Ages, certainly, you know, the, the fact that these images and legends about this saint are circulating, you know, across Europe in the later Middle Ages, you know, starting out probably in, in modern day Belgium, but then um, moving from Iberia to Scandinavia, from Italy to Germany, you know, it's very widespread. And that suggests that the church was at one point in its history quite accommodating. At the same time, I think in some of the images that I'm interested in and have been looking at in my research, there seems to be an, a, an attempt to perhaps suppress some elements of the saint's identity, particularly the beard, um, which is the common attribute. So usually when the saint is depicted in art, she's depicted on a cross, crucified or holding the cross as an attribute with a beard. But there are some images um, which seem to be um, less certain about whether the saint is bearded or not. And one of the most famous of these is a painting by um, the artist Hieronymus Bosch. Art historians have come up with various theories about who the saint is in this image, but these days most art historians agree that it probably represents Ontkoma or Wilgefortis, although other uh, identities have been proposed for the saint. But 
the whole interpretation of this saint as Wilberforce's hangs on whether or not Bosch has depicted the crucified figure in the painting with a beard. And you can you can see um, that it is difficult to tell, at least, you know, unless you go close up where there seems to be some sort of hints of shadow on the the, the chin and um, just below below the lips. But, you know, conservators and modern art historians have endlessly debated whether, in fact, Bosch has represented a beard, and if so, whether this is, in fact, Wilberforce's or someone else. And this could be because there's a sort of anxiety on the artist's part or um, the part of the patrons to represent this gender ambiguity in the figure. So while there's an accommodation on the one hand, there might also be signs of some kind of anxiety or suppression on the other. That's interesting because, I mean, my naive look, you know, looking at the, the, the picture would say, if you showed me the face, I would say, that's, that's a young man. Yeah. Whereas if you look at the, the body, clearly a, a female body. Yeah, no, exactly. And in that sense, I, I would say that in some ways, Wilga Fortis could be seen as a sort of ultimate non-binary figure in that, you know, she doesn't fit, you know, neatly into our, our current um, sex and gender categories. I mean, was there a point when, let's say, the cult of um, Wilber Forte mm -hmm. disappeared? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to, 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 to say exactly because it varies so much depending on where you are in Europe. So, you know, the, the cult of Wilber Fortis in England, or Uncumber, as she's known in England, um, emerges very late and is then suppressed at the Reformation in the 1530s. So it has a very short window in which it develops. But there are a few um, images of the saint from from England. One of the most interesting for me is actually here in London um, at Westminster Abbey. It's an image that visitors don't always look out for, but it's in Henry VII's chapel in Westminster Abbey. It's from the early 16th century. There were the fortresses standing, holding her cross, and very clearly and visibly bearded, as you can see here, and stood in a long line of other um, saintly figures. And this is a more humble depiction, again, from England from the early 16th century in Worcester Church in Norfolk on the rude screen. Again, very heavily damaged, probably damaged by iconoclasts in the aftermath of the Reformation. In this case, the face has been very heavily damaged and scratched and you can't make out the details. But I think because of the way she's crucified and the dress and so forth really resonates with some of these other images, this very likely is, is Wilgefortis. This is a wall painting from the cathedral in Ghent, St. Barbo's Cathedral. Um, so this is, you know, almost life-size mural. It's quite heavily damaged, but you can still just see the, the traces here of a little forked brownish-black beard there matching the hair of the saint. And there's also a little label at the bottom saying St. Oncoma. So we definitely know that this is our saint. And um, so, so in quite sort of monumental public contexts as well, you're seeing this image, you know, in cathedrals, in... In, in Westminster Abbey. Um, and then this is a particularly fascinating image that I got to see on a trip last year in northern France in the, in the, the city of Beauvais, um, in St. Stephen's Church in Beauvais. Um, it's really monumental statue. It's about two meters high. Um, the saint is shown um, crucified with a beard um, represented very explicitly, this brown beard and mustache. Um, one of the interesting things about this particular figure, because again, it has a sort of real tension between female embodiment, curvaceous um, hips, a, a sort of you know, belt around the waist, and perhaps a little bit of shadowing around the chest, suggesting breasts, but a very square jawline, thick neck, um, and then this, this very explicit beard. One of the interesting things about this particular um, statue is that in the 19th century a, a, an attempt was made to suppress the gender ambiguity um, and to turn the image into something a bit more normative. Um, so basically the clergy in the church decided to have the statue shaved. Um, basically the beard probably was originally carved onto the statue and then they had it chiseled off um, in an attempt to try and render the body more female in appearance because they'd seen in a guidebook to Bove a reference to an image in the church called the Christ Hermaphrodite. And they thought, well, we can't have that. We can't have people visiting to see Christ the Hermaphrodite because that would just be beyond the pale. And so they thought, well, we want to keep the image on display, but let's try and you know, normalize it and make it more um, palatable um, for tourists and, and churchgoers. And so that's what they did. 
But then the beard was then painted back on um, at some point later in its history, and indeed it underwent a restoration a few years ago. So now you can see it in its full non-binary, gender-ambiguous status, which is really wonderful. Have you got any sense that um, maybe worship of this saint was um, more prevalent in countries that had a more liberal attitude? I think it's very difficult to answer yeah. that in some ways because you know we don't we don't have a, a window onto medieval worshippers and what their interests are in this sense and we you know a lot of the um, you know um, interpretation is quite speculative I guess um, so you know it's very difficult to make a sort of you know um, case for linking someone who's of you know differently you know it perceives themselves. Um, it, it, Dif as being differently gendered, as you know, having a different sexual orientation, you know, in the distant past, and linking that sense of identity and selfhood um, to these these images and this saint's cult, um, especially for the sort of period that I'm interested in, really, which is the later Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, that said, I think there are all sorts of reasons why this figure has become a figure of significance for trans, queer, non-binary people today. There are also reasons why this figure is significant for, um, for, for differently um, gendered and differently embodied women um, in various ways. So for example, there are medical conditions that cause um, hair growth um, of various kinds, which is not stereotypically seen as, as feminine, as being part of a sort of, you know, the characteristics we usually associate with the female body. Um, for example, polycystic ovary syndrome um, is one of these medical conditions which can cause um, hair growth on both the body um, and face um, of, of women. And I think this, um, you know, work Fortis has sometimes been taken up by communities by individuals as a figure of significance. Um, and, you know, certainly Wilberforce's features on online calendars of LGBT plus saints, for example, today. And because the figure has been taken up today by differently gender, differently sexed communities, you know, my guess is that there are people in the Middle Ages who would have found soccer, would have found meaning um, in this kind of of imagery. I mean, if we look at some of the, you know, the, I was talking about the Bosch painting where the beard is quite insignificant, but if we look at some of the other um, images from around that time or just before Bosch painted that painting, you'll see that the, the beard is really quite um, bushy, you know, it's quite, it's quite explicit. The body um, seems quite female, but again, you get that sort of real sense of disjunction between um, male um, and female. And this, you know, the, these are um, images in medieval, late medieval books of hours and other kinds of manuscripts. But this is a really a multimedia um, representation of the saint. Um, this is a wonderful embroidered garment uh, which was made in the Burgundian Netherlands in the 15th century, which features a whole host of different female virgin martyrs, um, St. Agnes, St. Cecilia, St. Dorothy and so forth. But among the saints, is Wilgefortis, who's represented carrying the cross on which he was crucified, dressed in a very female-looking garment, um, cinched waist, um, looking very female in her body, and yet has a very distinctive forked beard, and is also carrying a rope in her hands, which is um, representing one of the ropes that was used to bind her to the cross. But the fact that the rope has come undone is also a sign um, of her ability to release people from their their sufferings. And I think, again, that idea of Wilgefortis being a figure of significant for people who are looking to be released from some kind of burden, um, you know, might um, resonate with audiences today, thinking about being released from the burden of, you know, gender binaries, for example, um, and categories of sexuality and desire, um, or indeed um, being released from some of the um, um, pejorative associations of being, for example, a female-bodied person um, with facial hair. Um, so I think, um, you know, I can again see why this kind of imagery might have been significant to audiences in the Middle Ages, even though we can only speculate as to, you know, why an individual worshipper might have been dedicated to this particular saint. No, that, that's, that's really interesting because, I mean, you, you get sometimes a sense everybody was straight till 1950. Mm. And um, that um, is nonsense, of of, 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 of course, but we need to be sort of um, reminded of that. Yeah.
Absolutely. I mean, for me, what's so significant about this material, because the Middle Ages is a period that we tend to associate with very fixed gender stereotypes, you know, the sort of chivalric ideal of the knight in shining armor saving the damsel in distress. I mean, I'm getting very sort of stereotypical here, but I think in the popular imagination, those kind of gender stereotypes um, still persist. And when people think of the medieval, that's what they immediately go to. And so for me, this imagery challenges that perception of the Middle Ages as a period of gender norms, and rather suggests that the Middle Ages themselves were very accommodating of differently bodied ideals of, um, you know, and those could sometimes be seen indeed as, you know, um, spiritually enabling. And, and that extends to Christianity more broadly, I think, as a, um, as, as a religion in the Middle Ages. Um, you know, the idea that um, by, um, you know, desiring Christ, by desiring to have Christ as your lover, which is what Wilberfortis desires herself, you also, in a sense, become Christ. You turn into Christ. You identify with him. You are him. And in a way, what that's what happens to Wilberfortis. By growing the beard, by being crucified, she also is Christ, in a sense. And that, that sort of ambiguity between both having and being Christ, I think that sort of does something quite queer to how we're thinking about gender and sexuality. You know, what does it mean to both love someone and become them at the same time? Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots more that could be said about, about, about these images. I think the, the final image, I guess, perhaps just to talk about is an image that I saw just a couple of weeks ago going to an abbey north of Brussels called Grimbergen Abbey, which is much more famous for its beer. But in its art collections, it has this amazing panel showing the crucifixion of Wilberforces. The panel probably dates from the early 1500s or around about the turn of the century. It, again, is quite heavily damaged, but very clearly shows Wilgefortis with a, a very clear beard. I mean, I spoke to the abbot of Grimbergen, who, you know, didn't know how it had come into the abbey's collections. But on the back of this painting, um, uniquely, um, there is a panel which shows another scene from Wilgefortis's life, which is probably the Sicilian prince who tries to marry her, laying siege to the King of Portugal because he's so angry that she's refused his hand in marriage. Um, so it suggests, you know, really that sort of narrative around why Wilberforce is an important figure, this idea that she releases people from their sufferings, releases people from their burdens, and really showing quite explicitly what's at stake here. You know, this is someone who's going to war with her father because he essentially wants to force her to marry him and she won't play ball. And I think that's um, you know, quite a powerful metaphor. Fascinating. Thank you so much.